Hi, this is Joe Shannon. I'm a lawyer, a husband, a father of six kids, and I also uh, host a podcast called Opening Statement with Joe Shannon. Please consider listening to our podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple, and any other folks that host podcasts. Just Google Joe Shannon and podcast and you'll find it. I hope you enjoyed the show. So we're really lucky to uh, catch um, Jill Myers today. Um, And we've been looking forward to this interview because, you know, I don't really interview that many people with such an eclectic background. So she's an educator now. She is a former prosecutor, uh, a consultant to uh, HBO for the TV, The Wire, for a number of years. Uh, Just a really cool person to talk to, but also just heavily involved in her community in Macomb. And um, we're catching her, just catching, getting off the bus from delivering lunches to kids in the school district. And I really want to thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. So, um, Jill, why don't you you, uh, tell us a little bit about your upbringing? I I really want to, one of the things that I want to do in this interview is to find out how people got to where they're at. So um, a lot of, uh, in my experience, a lot of what what, uh, makes us tick now was where we came from. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Where were you born and your parents, that type of situation? I was born here in Illinois, in Champaign, Illinois. Um, and my father was a civil engineer and he worked for International Harvester and he took a job with um, Sperry Rand, New Holland in New Holland, Pennsylvania. So we moved there. And my mother was a um, elementary school teacher. She spent 30 years teaching first grade. So my sisters and I, we basically were raised that um, first we all had to get an education. That was the number one thing that my parents demanded. They're both graduates of the University of Illinois. And they also impressed us on, well, my father was um, very interested in seeing America. So every year we would go see America for summer vacations. And I continued that tradition with my kids. So we travel, we've all seen every one of the 50 states in pretty much every um, nuance of them. So that's a uh, fascinating thing. But they were also huge into public service. They, they were always giving back and there would be huge debates about the politics and who's doing enough and who's not and that kind of stuff. So I think it inspired all of us to basically just try to give back as much as we could. So, um, so it's you and two sisters then uh, growing up? Right. I have uh, two sisters, one younger, one older, and I have um, two brothers. They were adopted. They were both um, Lakota Indians. And so that when we were in high school is when they were adopted. So, Wow, that's great. Now, where's the, where's the Lakota tribe? It's in um, basically it's shoved off into the Dakotas and into Canada right now. That, so it's, it's not one of our proudest moments in American history about what we did. So, No, I get that. Yeah, right. yeah I, I, I'm really, uh, I'm a fan of uh, history. Uh, and I love U.S. history, and the, the Native American experience is, you know what, it's not written enough about, it's, and, it's not writ- and there's not enough um, really good uh, movies or television shows about it, but, I mean, you know, I guess because this is so sad, mm-hmm. but um, I, I really like the fact that your folks took you around uh, the U.S. That, that was, that's a good move, don't you think? I think so. I mean, that's why I did it with my kids. It was a lot of fun. And again, you get to see how different we are as a nation. It, yeah, sure. The different music, the different cultures, the food, you name it. Everything is, it's just a completely different world. So were, were you then mainly, your part of your growing up was in um, New Holland, Pennsylvania? Yes. Well, actually Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Okay. And so, and Lancaster, um, is that near Amish country? Yes. It is basically so, the heart of the Amish country. Did you so? Did you have any interaction with the Amish people growing up? 
not um, particularly. I mean, yes, we saw them. They were always out. You know, we, we would, you know, say hi and all those kind of things to them. But they have their own schools and everything else. So, yeah. So you, you grew up and then you graduated high school in Lancaster? Yes. All right. So then you made a move from there east when not the other folks went west. What, what, tell me the story there. Okay. So, well, no, then I went from... I went to Millersville and got my um, undergraduate degree in psychology and social sciences. And as my mother demanded, we all got degrees so that we could teach because that was her philosophy back at the day that we would all get a teaching certificate. And uh, again, when I got out again, it was the you know mid seventies and there weren't a lot of teaching positions then. So i got a job as a paralegal um, working in DC. And I also, I got married about the same time as well. So when I was paralegal, I said, I can do this job. Why? And I'm making nothing. So I might as well go to law school. So I went to law school at that point in time and got my first job when I graduated from law school um, as a um, working for legal aid, representing abused and neglected kids. And then because I couldn't pay my mortgage with the salary they did, I sold out, as I said, to the prosecutor's office. Okay. So... And that's in, that's in Baltimore? Yes. So you went to school, law school, University of Baltimore? Yes. Tell me about, about that experience. I mean, it was, it was convenient. It was, I mean, I, I'm the pre-law advisor at Western, and again, I probably did everything I tell my students not to. I applied to the one school. I applied to it because it was on my route home from work. And that's why I decided I was working in D.C. at a large law firm as a paralegal. And I would just drive past the University of Baltimore on the way home. And I went there. I mean, it was it was a great experience. I mean, I enjoyed for the most part. I think it's easier now with everything online so that I didn't have to go to, you know, back then I had to go to the law library and read all the cases. Now I could have stayed home and done that. But other than that, it was a great experience. That's great. And so then that started your career uh, when, when you started working at the prosecutor's office. Tell us a little bit about that. So in Baltimore, they start you out either at the traffic court, district court, or juvenile division. Since I came from representing abuse and neglected children, I went to the juvenile division. And eventually I became the head of the habitual offender unit and where we prosecuted the what I would call the worst of the worst juveniles. And it was a shame because I saw the exact same kids that I represented as abused and neglected five years later, they were now um, the criminals or the respondents in the juvenile cases that we had. So clearly we're not doing a great job in the juvenile system in this country. And from there, um, because I had a penchant for trial work, as my mother said, the reason probably I went to law school, she said I had to make a living with my mouth. So, <laughs> so I did. So I like being the litigator because I like to think on my feet. And from there, I went to the drug unit for a while. And then I moved on to the um, wiretap electronic surveillance unit where I did that for the last 10 or so years of my career. So how long were you total in the, the uh, prosecutor's office in Baltimore? 21 years. Wow. And, um, you know, I, uh, that, you know, we're, I'm in Chicago area and, and you're Western Illinois. It's, you know, I thought about be becoming a prosecutor. I, in fact, before I went to law school, I, um, I, I was a summer at, I grew up in the Yakima, Washington, Yakima, Washington um, area. And so I went to so spend a summer, just didn't get paid or anything. And I just wanted to see what prosecutors do. And I, I saw the amazing work that these folks were doing because they weren't the highly paid folks, these uh, attorneys, and they were helping take care of all the mess and the, the crime and all this stuff that was happening in our community that a lot of people don't even see. But I just, you know, for, for me, it was so sad to see folks at such a young age. And then once they get into that system, it's hard to get out. Yes. Did you see that? Did you see that in, in your experience? All the time. I mean, it is a sad thing. That's why the juvenile system is designed to hopefully prevent them from becoming a part of the criminal justice system. We try to, we spend, we're spending our money trying to rehabilitate and redirect people. And I think that we're getting better at it, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, I, I, 
it's such a complex problem, especially in Chicago as well, um, in any in large urban city and in you know, rural areas as well, obviously, um, where you are now. But um, boy, I, I wish the really smart people and, and people with big hearts like yourself could figure this out, how we could, you know, just, you know, one at a time, save, you know, you know, the whole, not save people, but basically maybe inspire them mm -hmm. to take a different route and have a different system in place to, to figure that I, what are some ideas that you have that um, could avoid these folks from getting into trouble in the first place and maybe move them to a different, you know, place? Is it moving to a different uh, community? Is it, is it um, some sort of uh, community involvement. What do you think? What are some of the some of the ideas that you have? I think part of it would be the education is always a key. That um, we need to encourage them to actually stay in school and why school is relevant to what they're doing. I also think that because most of the parents want their kids to achieve and want their kids to be successful and do things, even if they themselves aren't. So, but I think that we need to find a way to divide this class between the poverty and those who have. Because again, there's no way when I was prosecuting kids, how could I tell you quit being a drug dealer and go to school when you're making $5,000, literally $5,000 a week selling drugs on the streets in Baltimore. There's no job that you're gonna get with your high school diploma that you're gonna be making that kind of money. And so they, we've got to encourage them to think about the future as opposed to just the current times. That, I think that was the part that was the most eye-opening to me, that when you'd ask kids, like at Western, I asked you know, the students where they want to be. They want to be a cop, they want to be a firefighter, emergency manager, or whatever, or a lawyer. They've all got plans and goals for the future. When you ask these kids um, that we were dealing with in the criminal justice system, they had no future plans because they didn't expect to have a future. They truly believe that I'm gonna live for now because I probably won't be alive after I'm 21, 22 years of age. So I, to get past that mentality is incredible. I mean, it takes a lot for them to want to do that and they're gonna to have to have support systems. Yeah, you know, I, I'm involved with a couple of groups, you know, loosely um, in the city and I, um, that, that I support. And there's, there's a, a type of uh, one group that is really great um, they provide mentors to uh, a lot of kids um, that don't have any, you know, father figures whatsoever. And um, they have a relationship basically with them, a mentor relationship where they, they they're, have a connection with them from age five to the time they graduate from high school, even college and afterwards. And that's a small thing, but I think it's a good one. Um, there, there's another school that was just opened, I want to say within the last five or ten years in Chicago, called uh, Chicago Jesuit, which uh, the, um, the I can't remember, I think his name is Gies, G-I-E-S, the, the guy that, uh, he's, a, he's a private equity guy, and he, the, the Illinois School of Business is named after him, but he funded a lot of that, and it's a great school where I think it's from uh, uh, K to, to 12, but they're there from seven o'clock in the morning till three or four in the afternoon, and it's a pretty intense program. But it's you know right in Austin, uh, so I think maybe maybe a, a more of a private partnership, even the more the better. Mentorship works. The private partnerships work. I mean, in Baltimore, one of our biggest success stories is the um, the, the former owner of the um, Jiffy Loops there was an individual who had a very troubled juvenile past and he was taken on by um, a, a gentleman who showed him how to do car repairs and things like that. And, and the, he came up with the idea about, let's do something really well, really fast. And he donated most of his money that he made when um, through Jiffy Loop to rehabilitating and creating centers for these kids. And he does it across several states. I know he does it there in Illinois. Clearly, he was huge in um, Maryland that did that. So we've got a lot. Oh, that's of, great. You got a lot I'm of people gonna... like that. Huge. And again, you've got the Milton Found Hershey Foundation. They do, you know, they do it for the non-delinquent, but the abused or the neglected or the orphan kids. So there's a lot of people in private organizations that do it, and they're very successful. We just need more of that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, figure out what we individuals can do and just do it rather than sit around talking about it, right? Right. That's great. That's great. Well, um, well, super. So then um, you decided to retire from the, the prosecutor's office. Um, what was the next move? Well, I was always teaching. I would teach for the Baltimore Police Department. I would do their trainings and things like that, the legal updates. And I also taught at the University of Baltimore and at the Carroll Community College and the criminal justice programs. And I really enjoyed inspiring people to go into this, what I think is an important area of criminal justice. So I was it was kind of, it was getting too much to be a prosecutor with the cases I was doing. There were a lot of death threats that I was receiving. I noticed that my youngest son was afraid to even get the mail because he thought there would be a drive-by shooting or something because he'd hear me talking on the phone and, and working on cases. So I thought enough is enough. So I went online and I saw at higher ed, they had this opening for a professor in criminal justice and I had never heard of Macomb. And I said, oh, I'll apply to this make em job. And I, <laughs> and I got the interview and then I went out there and it was like, my family thought I'd lost my mind. Like, why are you going to the middle of nowhere and just picking up and moving? And we did, and my middle son was taking pictures out of the car window. Like, look what she's done. There's no interstates. <laughs> But I think that in the end, it turned out really, really well. It's a, it's a great place to raise kids. The, the freedoms, I mean, my youngest son, he could ride his bike around. Um, he could ride it to school. So, I mean, it's just a nice environment. And I, I really enjoy the teaching. How many kids do you have? I have three boys. Oh, wow. Three boys. I got two of them. And I, I got four girls and two boys. And the, the boys, that's a little bit different recipe. So... God bless you on the three boys. So um, that's wonderful. So, so your kids and you guys moved out to Macomb and you started working in, in that system. Tell me what it was like, the, the, the program that you had back then and what it's like now. So I'm in the School of Law Enforcement and Justice Administration, and back then it was the LEJA program, and now we're a school. So we have gone from basically being mostly law enforcement, criminal justice, to we now have a fully um, online and face-to-face -face fire program. We're in the top six in the nation in our fire program out there. We were just voted number one, the best online criminal justice program in the nation this last, like two weeks ago. And we now have emergency management as another bachelor um, degree under our program. So we've expanded in that sense. So, and we're, I think what we're doing is we are preparing people for doing the jobs. So that a lot of the, um, the big schools in the criminal justice program prepare you to be, to understand the theories and to do the research and things like that. We are preparing you to go out and actually be the firefighter, be the fire chief, be the emergency manager, be, you know, work at Homeland Security or wherever, or be the law enforcement officer at any um, capacity. We also have now, I believe we are up to nine minors so we've got a minor in corrections, a minor in criminalistics, which is our CSI minor. We've got minors in law enforcement and justice administration and homeland security, private security, emergency management in two aspects. We have a tactical emergency management minor and an operational one for those who wanna work. Um, because right now we're seeing with the COVID in particular that agencies don't work by themselves. They need to work and train. Fire have to be there at the table with the law enforcement. The emergency managers have to be there at the table. Homeland is always at the table with everybody. So we are combining that in our programs. And so we've got a whole mixture of where people are working. And we have a legal studies minor. So we've got a lot of different um, balls in the air. And, and I'm really fortunate that every person who teaches in my program has done the job. So they, like I obviously have a, the law background, so I teach the law classes. The people who are teaching the policing classes have done the job for 30, 35 years. We have them from all over the country from, we just hired one of the Pennsylvania state troopers who was um, one of the um, supervisors capacity there, leaders in their area. The same thing coming from Los Angeles. We have police chiefs, state police um, individuals from Illinois. So the fire, um, department um, are all former chiefs and deputy chiefs and the same with emergency management people who have done evacuations both evacuation at home and 
you know, the get out of the area type of evax and everything else. So I think the practical aspect makes all the difference. Yeah, you know, um, I, well, you and I both went to law school and they didn't teach you a lick about how to, how to, you know, practice law, you know, the business side of law or anything like that. It was, it was mainly figuring out contracts and torts and taxes. And so I really like that approach. And I bet the folks that go there really appreciate your approach too, because they don't feel like that they're just going into, you know, you know, from, you know, in, in the frying pan. Well, ask Sydney, because I had her, I believe, for the, um, the criminal procedure class where we talk about the Supreme Court cases, and then I make one poor student has to come up on stage and, you know, swear to tell the truth and be the officer in the case and give me the facts and, and support whatever the, um, the ruling or the holding is in that case to the best that they can without giving me their opinion or anything else. And when they're doing it, they hate it. But afterwards, I get a lot of, you know, it's just like that when we go to court. Well, you know, that, that's the thing. I, uh, I, I, uh, and, and um, your reference to Sydney is Sydney Patino, who's the producer of this show with, uh, along with Ashley Zurich. And so, um, Sydney, thank you so much for securing your former professor. And you convinced, uh, I guess she was convinced this, that it was important enough that she's now going to law school. So that was great job, day. professor. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so yeah, you know the um, you know as as far as teaching goes, this 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 kind of a loosely Socratic method that you're using by getting people to stand up and and you know it, it's my experience that we need to challenge students. You know I you know I have high expectations for them, and you know tell them it's okay to fail, and especially in front of people because you know as you you know as a trial lawyer. Um, we're, we, we make mistakes in front of the jury, in front of the judge all the time, but it's the folks that can kind of admit that, have the humility to deal with it, and then move on, rather than, oh, always worried about making a mistake. So I think, God, keep that up. Keep, keep the, and plus, listen, one of the biggest beefs, I think, in, in higher education is that they're allowed to just sit there and do nothing and listen, where I think it's more important to be actually interested and curious about what's I mean, like, for example, those rulings you're talking about, some of these rulings, the, the rationale people don't understand unless they go through it, why somebody isn't, why a police officer isn't entitled to, you know, uh, do a search or seizure without, you know, probable cause and, and why that's good and, and bad and all that type of stuff. And don't you agree? I agree very much. That's why I like them to learn how to apply it. Like I tell them, they're never going to get another Miranda situation. They're going to get something with a little bit different facts. How are you going to use the Miranda rules for that? How are you going to use, you know, the Terry stop and frisk rules? And they all come in with a good heart and they all want to, I mean, they all say I'm going into it because I really want to help. I want to make the world better. I want to do these things. So this is their opportunity to start now following through and making sure that they can do it, that they're getting the practical application and and it's tough. The, and again, it's okay to make a mistake if you're doing it for the right reasons. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, um, that is, I mean, the one thing that I, you know, with younger people, I think sometimes is they're afraid to take risks because they don't want to make mistakes. And, you know, I'm glad we have folks, you know, like you in the classroom that are saying, listen, there's risks involved all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to have good faith and you have to have a reason for why you're doing things the right way. And if you're a prosecutor, you prosecute to protect the public and to make sure that things are safe um, and, that, and that make sure that there's proper punishment in, in that situation. Whereas if you're a defense attorney and you and your person you're defending, you go you know, as hard as you can to defend that person and make sure that you force the prosecutor to prove their, prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, these are all constitution. That's how the constitution comes alive. Yeah. Is these things very much so? Yeah. So, so, so I I, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, your program and and where you're going with it. So right now, you I mean, you obviously talk about an incredible I don't know meta metamorphosis going from where you guys were when you first got there to where you are now. What's the next step? What are you doing to improve the program at, at Western Illinois? Well, like um, about a week and a half ago, we just redid our entire emergency management curriculum so that we are now going to be there 
emergency management is going to be um, soon to be an accredited um, program. And we have aligned ourselves so for what we think the accreditation standards are. We've also aligned ourselves with all the regulations that are necessary for higher education, for the Army regulations 525 and some of the Air Force regulations that are out there. What's FEMA expecting? What's Homeland expecting? How are we going to do this? Like I said, and we've combined it so that we're not going to be doing siloed training. We're not going to be doing a class simply for people who want to go into emergency management. They're going to have to sit there with fire people in the room and law enforcement people in the room. We've also added to our curriculum that um, the drone and the technology aspects of it, because right now um, here in Macomb, we have the 911 Next Generation um, system. We've also had some, a couple of tornadoes and we had flooding last year and those kind of things. And we're sending the drones up and taking real time pictures in both the night scope and um, the day and we're sending it to the police cars in there on their ipads so that they can respond immediately to a disaster or something and can see it in real time where there may be human life issues as opposed to property damage so we're using that kind of technology we're also in like our um, criminalistics classes there is such a huge um, push now for the students to understand the technology and we refer to it as the cybersecurity aspect of our program, where there's not a crime that's out there that has not got some online component. Whether you're using social media, whether it's one of your Google apps that I can locate you through that with a warrant, or whether I'm going to go try to use, you know, the 23andMe and the DNA um, out there to link a person to a particular crime, if we have that kind of evidence that's out there. So, and again, I know from my wiretap and electronic um, surveillance background, you know, how important all of the, um, that information can be, how important it is to, um, well, for every agency to know where people are and what they're doing and how long they're there. I mean, when I look at phone bills and things like that, I still have my prosecutor hat on to see, am I using my phone as a private person or am I using it as a business call? Because I can tell by the length of the calls, the times of the calls, the, you know, the unique number of calls and all kinds of things. And then we're using programs like Analyst Notebook um, to figure out connections, the six degrees of separation to figure out what's your connection to me? How often, you know, have we met? What was, you know, what was that relationship to see? And again, I had the students put up different um, on the charts to figure out family relationships. How are they connected with each other? We have a Star Wars map on the wall to show how all of the figures from Star Wars are connected to Obi-Wan Kenobi and things like that. So, but it's, it's just so they can see that, you know, there is a connection. And right. What's the pattern and those kind of things. And I think the students are finding that that aspect um, fascinating. And then we, you know, we divide it up among which agencies that they may want to work for. Like they all want to work for the FBI because that, you know, everybody knows what the FBI is. But when we start to sit down and talk to them, we're spending more time saying, well, what you really want to do is you want to work for ATF. Or what you really want to do is for Homeland or you know, you're a perfect fit for a sheriff's department or a large agency or small agency. So, or the U.S. Marshals or something like that. So, and when you talk to them about it, and then we tell them about the agencies that they don't know about. Amtrak has a federal law enforcement um, right. one, and nobody knows that. And again, like the one student who I convinced to um, do his internship there, he calls up, he's all excited. And I said, you shouldn't be excited. He goes, there was the homicide. And because he was at Union Station. And I said, of course, it's a law enforcement job. You're going to get, you know, these things. And, you know, and it's Chicago. What can I say? It's right. It's going to happen. But, what are you doing? So, you know, one of the, um, one of the really important things I, I, I believe um, in law enforcement, uh, both as far as, you know, uh, all the agencies as well as the prosecutors is, you know, one of the number one things is the integrity of the, the person that's actually making these decisions because, you know, things aren't always black and white. Um, there's a big right and wrong and how far we go with uh, law enforcement and these decisions, you know, are su such huge decisions as to whether or not you prosecute somebody, whether or not you, you arrest somebody, uh, whether there's another route, 
tell me what you guys are doing at uh, Western to uh, educate um, the students on the, you know, the, the, the importance of integrity, uh, doing the right thing, having great belief systems, that type of thing. A couple of things. Now we have um, required classes. We have the ethics is a required class now. We, I think that the probably our biggest overall push of what we're trying to communicate in all the classes together are we want you to have good communication skills, both oral and written. And again, like I said in my class, that I'm interested in that you tell the truth and that you give facts and only facts. I don't want your opinion. The court will figure it out whether or not you've met the burden or you haven't, but we need the facts of it. And again, even in the sample problems, when I put you, like I said, I put you on that witness stand and I tell you to tell me the facts as you knew it in the whatever case we're talking about, if you make up a fact, I immediately, and you can talk to Sydney about it, I'll jump on them and say, are you lying? Are you committing perjury right now? And I fire them and send them back and they get all <laughs> upset. But I said, you, you know, words matter. And when you're saying something, make sure it is precise and it is accurate. We also um, talk a lot about, you know, leadership. That's the second, besides communication, leadership is so important. There is a time when you're going to be a leader and a time when you're going to be a follower. And we want to talk about what kind of leadership are you going to have? You know, it all comes down to, you know, what would you want done to you in that circumstance? So whether, like you said, whether you're going to prosecute or not prosecute, whether you're going to arrest or not arrest. So if you've got good communication skills and you're honest, that you can figure out that, yeah, this is, this is what happened, but I can understand the other side of it and then have discussions with the real leaders or people. So we do spend an awful lot of time with those kind of scenarios. We also then to kind of reinforce it because all of our students do internships and most of them go on to get the actual jobs. We do practical in, um, interviews with them where we'll ask them because most of the people, like I said, have done the job in my department. So they've been the people who have hired people. So they know the questions we're gonna be asking um, and they're gonna get. So we practice with them in a group of three and we talk to them about how to answer the questions that are the hard questions that, you know, like, have you ever used any illegal drugs? Have, you know, what's your feeling about X, Y, or Z? And you're gonna to have to give a true answer. So we practice with them in what would be the best way to answer that, to be honest, because again, your integrity is on the line. And, you know, that's all you have is your reputation. Like you sure. as a lawyer, that's really, if you don't have a good reputation, people aren't going to come to you. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. And so can you tell, um, I mean, you get, you've done a lot. In your life now, I'm just looking at. I know you're you're, you're gonna. I'm old. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I'm jealous. And I, I I I'm looking at this resume. It's pretty thick, and I'm like, you know, I'm looking at mine, and it's a lot thinner than that. And I'm and I'm trying to figure out some of the some of the habits that you have um, to make you effective. I, you know, one of the things that that I like to do in these in these podcasts is is to trying to help young people form how they how they can be successful people. Are there any any things that you can say as far as um, habits that you had in your career that have made you successful? I don't think you can ever be too prepared. So that like when I would go into any trial or any situation, I knew all the facts about my case. I also knew all the facts about the defense part of the, the case as well. So I knew my strengths and my weaknesses so that I was fully prepared. I didn't just try to wing anything. I mean, it causes a lot of sleeplessness and you know late nights and things like that but i think the you've got to put in the time and the energy behind it if you want to be good at it i also think like right now with my current position that i'm lucky that i have such a good group of people to work with and i mean i respect them for their expertise i do not jump in and tell the fire people, how to teach their fire classes or what's necessary. They know what they're doing. They've done it for, you know, 35 years. <laughs> so I allow them to do what they want and I keep shoving them, you know, let's do a little bit more. What else could we do? How can we get, you know, more students to come? How could we encourage more people to do it? What should we do in curriculum review? So I think that it's the giving respect to other people. So put the time in, respect other people for what they're good at and you know and like you said never be afraid of failure i mean 
nothing's going to happen to you if you fail. I mean, if you tried it and it didn't work, well, it didn't work. Right, right. So t- tell me how you um, balanced your personal life with your with your kids and your professional life. I mean, obviously, pretty stressful when your kid's afraid to go to the mailbox. And then now, with, you know, you, you, you've helped build, you know, one of the number one criminal justice uh, universities in the country. Uh, that's a lot of pressure and stress. How do you balance both of them? Well, I mean, I have to say, my kids would probably say that, you know, that I didn't give them as much time as they wanted. And looking back, again, because when you're in the middle of a trial, you can't say, oh, I can't come in today because I have a personal issue or something like that. So it is a struggle to balance. I do think, though, that the move from Baltimore to the teaching was helpful because that gave me more control. Being a trial attorney, you don't have control over your schedule. Whereas being a professor, I have a little bit more control over when I plan things and what I'm going to be, you know, when I'm going to be doing things. I can grade late at night after the kids went to bed or something like that. But I had to be in court every day from nine to, you know, five thirty or six. So that I didn't have control over. Right. So you you said you've driven through all fifty states, huh? Yes. And uh, so tell tell us some of your favorite places to go and, and with the kids and, and what you've seen. And I, mean, I, I love, so I, I'll just confess, I like to drive uh, with my kids and, and my, my poor daughter, Nora, who just turned uh, 16, this was going to be her year to drive to uh, the Oregon coast with me. Cause um, when they hit, when we hit Montana, I give them the, the keys and say go, cause it's 12 hours of just, you know, straight expressway and, to miss that, but some what what are some of your favorite memories of driving a, even with either with your your mom and dad or or with your kids? I think that they're all. I mean, every trip be when we come back, we say, "Oh, that was one of the best trips." And uh, again, my kids cringe when um, I see a brown sign because I'm addicted to any of the um, the historic. Um, part markers out there we have to go see them I'm like who wouldn't want to see the big ball of string I mean come on (laughs) who doesn't want to know that kind of stuff so we go through all that and again my youngest son um, Cole he set up a rule for me which cracked me up um, that we can only see two dead presidents in a day that was his rule because we were you know we were doing the um, the Virginia um, tours of all the places and you know you have Madison and Monroe and the whole and he's like no you can pick two. That's all we're going to go see. So I love to see the the presidential libraries. I think those are just fascinating. But again, when we were in um, Michigan and Minnesota, we found um, there was a sculptor up there. And I kept seeing these. They he makes um, statues and sculptings out of um, blades for the lawnmowers. And they're humongous. And I mean, so, and they're all over. So he has one that is basically a coffee cup being poured or something like that. And I kept seeing them. So we pulled off to the side of the road and there was a um, a post office, you know, in probably for like 10 people was the post office. I went in and I said, I keep seeing these statues. Do you know, you know, is there a map of where they are or who was it? And she says, oh, that's my husband. And really? he was, and we live right up a road here. And he, she gave us a little, you know, draw, drew it. And we went to the house. And in his garage, he was making um, more sculptures of different things. He's got like a huge 10-foot crane that's sticking out of a pond that he made out of it. He's made dinosaurs. So um, Ken Nige, I think is his name. And his daughter turned out to be one of the astronauts on the Russian um, Space Center. So I can just meet these people across the country and we are big foodie people. So we have to eat food wherever you go. And we (laughs) do a lot of the road scholar um, tours, which I think are fascinating. I never heard of that. What's a road scholar tour? It's um, basically, they they used to be the, um, the elder hostels, but now they have it for children and families as well as other people. And you sign up and it's a particular event. So last year, my sister and her husband and I, we went on the Lewis and Clark expedition. So we did the whole thing from um, the Missouri all the way out to um, Portland, Oregon. It was um, 
I think it was 17 days. We took the trip just like um, Lewis and Clark did. We got to, I mean, I decided that after the third day that I would have just given up and died. I cannot do this if I was really them with the struggles they went through. But it was fat. Every day we had, they give you lectures about what you're seeing, how to build a, you know, a keel boat, um, you know, how they, they were going to eat. And we, you know, we even had a lecture on salt. And I thought, how could a lecture on salt be interesting? Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Because salt was the survival. Hold so, on a second. So 17 days and uh -huh. were, you, were you in your car? No, it's a bus trip. You get on the bus, you drive. Some days you'll drive 10 or 15 minutes. You stop at a Lewis and Clark spot. They have experts on the trip with you is a historian. We have books that we read that we go on that in advance if you want to. We did another one we did with the national parks out west. And again, we were with a tremendous amount of families that were on the national park tour. So we went from them all the way um, from Mount Rushmore down to the Grand Canyon. And then we ended up back in um, the Salt Lake City area. But I mean, we, it, you get an explanation of everything you're doing. I love those trips. So it's R-O-A-D, scholar. R-O-A-D, okay, I'm gonna remember that one. I've never heard of that. And so that was worth, worth and, the call on the whole thing. Is, um, most of it is part of it. It's fascinating to see. We did one at Christmas. We went out to um, San Francisco and to see how in San Francisco they um, dealt with the Christmas holidays and things like that. So it was, I mean, we've learned all kinds of things. I did not, I mean, I don't know a lot about art. And so we had people who come in and talk about the Renaissance art and things like that. And now that, now when I see pictures, I feel like, I can tell that's a Renaissance um, portrait or not that kind of, so that's it's very, great. so it's really, and again, as my son, the same one who says that we can only see two dead presidents on, in one day, he also said, we never went on vacations. We go on field trips. Oh, yeah. But I, I tell you, you know, um, I, I think traveling, especially um, how, I don't think Americans understand how huge their country is. I mean, when I drive, you know, people say, you know, I tell them, yeah, I'm driving to Oregon tomorrow. They, they look at me like I'm absolutely crazy. And, you know, you can do it in two and a half days, three days, if you went really fast, or you can go slower. But I mean, seeing the, you know, the Badlands, seeing Mount Rushmore, seeing how beautiful Wyoming and Montana and Colorado and Oregon, I mean, Oregon, I, I love Oregon. I love, I grew up in Washington state on the Eastern side. So, I mean, this stuff is, is great to me and I, and I encourage people if they're listening to this get in your car and just start driving I mean it's it's something else and uh, well, I'm gonna try that road scholar thing if I can convince anybody in my family to do it there's another thing that I use and it's called off the beaten path books so they have one for almost every state and again my family when I moved out here and thought I'd lost my mind um, I said, come out and visit and we'll, you know, we'll do, you know, this year we'll do Iowa. They go, Iowa, who would want to go to Iowa? What's the point? I said, it's a destination. And sure enough, I mean, you'd be surprised of all the different places that um, in Iowa that we saw. The yeah. Billy, Billy clocks and things like that, that no one has ever heard of. And I'm like, I mean, most of the artists and things I hate to say are completely off their, out of their mind, but their artwork is just incredible. They made these beautiful clocks with all kinds of um, mythical themes and things like that using a sewing machine as a scroll saw. Really? And the Smithsonian has tried for years to buy them. And again, they, will, they never left the 35 miles around wherever these billy clocks are, um, where there's some place in northern Iowa is the name of the little town they're at, but it's just an incredible collection. How do you spell that? The, the clock? Billy, I believe it's like B-I-L-L-Y or may, uh, maybe it's I-E, the Billy Clocks. Huh, interesting. So tell me, um, b before I forget, I, I, I got to ask you about something that, that, I, that I think people will found fascinating is that you were a consultant with HBO for The Wire. I was really, all I did was that it's, it sounds more impressive. I was the legal script consultant. So they would look at, they would give me a copy of the script and to see whether it was fit 
in terms of perhaps the language they were using for the court scenes and things like that, if it was correct. And also we wanted to make sure that we weren't divulging any of the, um, the secrets about how we were doing the, the wiretap and the electronic surveillance at the time. So that um, back then it was, Nextel was a big, um, one of the big phone provider and they advertised that they developed a phone in their, what um, Verizon calls direct talk or next to um, um, their talk to talk thing or group talk um, approach. And they said that we can't be intercepted. That was their advertisement. So every um, major drug gang and terrorist organization wanted a next phone because of that advertisement. You can't be intercepted. Well, that's not true. First off, we have yeah. a law in this country that you, the companies can't pr um, make anything or manufacture anything that we don't have the ability to intercept for that purpose. But more importantly, that we didn't want to talk about how we were able to intercept those kind of things with our court right. orders. So, okay. so it, was very, right. it was very interesting to do. And actually, a lot of the script um, came from our real cases because Ed Burns, one of the writers with David Simon, was a former homicide detective for the Baltimore Police Department. So... How about you? You're writing a book? No. I've, when I had to, um, for part of um, the job as a professor, we have to publish. So I wrote a juvenile justice book, textbook, and I wrote the book on cyberbullying and that kind of stuff. But that's enough for me. That, I, <laughs> I cannot so force me, myself to sit down and write. So um, I'm a big fan of, um, I, I like reading biographies. I like reading about American history, etc. What What are you reading right now? I, I like the suspense novels and things like that. So I read some Brad Metzler, um, if that's how you pronounce his name. And um, the, I like Baldacki's um, ones as well. So I, I like them because um, particularly, they usually are writing about the Virginia, Washington area that I know. So I like to see if they got the, you know, the geography straight and the facts and that kind of stuff. And then I like the little, the little legal intrigue in there that's kind of interesting so yeah do you do you miss being out east in the thick of it there in the dc baltimore area i still have to say the dc is probably one of my favorite um cities in the country it's got a power and an electricity to it i i mean and i my family still lives out there so my sister lives in um, Lewis, pennsylvania so we always go there and we visit again all the museums and everything. So we do a different one. The only one I haven't seen yet is the, um, the. I guess it would be the CIA museum that's out there. And I want to go see that one. What's Let's your favorite museum there. out there in DC? I think the um, American History Museum. Hmm. So. I don't know if I've been to that one. And then, tell me about, go ahead. They had an exhibit of creating a better mousetrap and they had, it used to be when you got a patent, you had to make a miniature of your device. And so they had and all the miniature devices second. out there. So it was interesting to see and we tried to guess what are these devices and what is it that they're creating. Interesting. So um, have you been to Mount Vernon? Yes. Tell me about that. Again, I mean, I, it's the traditional Virginia, um, again, homestead. So I think, I mean, I've been to so many of them that I don't find that to be, I think the ones in Boston are a little bit more interesting because they were, they're more um, authentic at that point in time. I mean, they try to make it and we've done all the tours and the same thing with the, um, some of the plantations that we've been to down in New Orleans and things like that. So I like Mount Vernon, but I think Monticello is much more interesting. Jefferson's more my kind yeah. of guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was re I'm, I read the, all the biographies of those guys and, and okay. just the, the, the absolute hate between Hamilton and Jefferson and, and Madison and, and then, you know, Washington kind of stayed aloof from it all, but you know, they went after him and it, it, it's just, you know, we thought somehow, I think uh, as Americans, we think that our politics is, is so dirty and, and messed up and whatever, but back then hand to hand combat. And, you know, I, that's why I think it's really good to read a lot of books and understand that the human condition doesn't change much over 250 years. 
Well, the sad thing is that, like I said, I was a Jefferson supporter minus the um, the slavery issue. And oh, I sure. thought, you know, I thought he was just the, you know, the best we could ever have as a president in terms of how Bright knew what he was doing. And then I did the Lewis and Clark tour and you get a completely different perspective of Jefferson. And it's like, what a pompous <laughs> individual. I mean, he basically just cut, you know, Lewis right out once Lewis lost his mind after he came back from that expedition. And it was like, he had no use for it. I used you and abused you and move on. And it's interesting. I mean, you're right. The politics was just incredible. Yeah. You know, I, you know, that's the, that's the one thing that, that our, our country, you know, I, you read, you know, my favorite uh, biographer is David Chernow, who has written Hamilton and Washington and all those. And, you know, the getting to understand these people, I mean, you know, you can't de deify any of these people because you, obviously, you know, the, the, the founders were all, I mean, they, they owned slaves and they actually sold slaves. And it was a, you know, awful, awful thing. And, and, you know, understanding the, the strengths and weaknesses of these fellows and, and same with Jefferson and, um, you know, Adams, his personal, you know, life and, and how he was and interesting he was and then all the other ones. But then you, you come to these f future presidents and just reading about uh, U.S. Grant and his story, uh, it's, I mean, understanding that both Grant and Lincoln were both married to Southern women who had their in-laws were rebels, basically. Right. And I mean, talk about a complicated in-law situation. I mean, I, I think Lincoln invited his in-laws to live with them at, uh, or no, Grant invited his in-laws to live with them at the White House. Which, how about that? <laughs> but listen, I wanted to thank you so much for coming in and talking to us. Um, oh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, as we, we have more interesting things come along, I, we were just talking this morning before we, we uh, started recording that, that about Baltimore situation with their surveillance and what they're doing there and all the different things that are going to be happening with, you know, that right now, as we speak here on May 1st, the very interesting um, uh, interplay between government and citizens mm -hmm. and the stay-at-home orders, et cetera. This is going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. It's going to be more important than ever that we have people of integrity in law enforcement, especially on the ground level as far as firefighters, first responders, police officers, and then the, uh, the prosecuting attorneys and those folks, how they handle these situations. Because we're, we're in a very delicate situation, don't you agree? Oh, absolutely, because it's easy to abuse people's privacy. I mean, because I can see many things, I mean, you know, that you really shouldn't have the right to see. Yeah, yeah, so good. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jill. And, and listen, I, um, I, I can't wait to, to see what happens um, uh, at Western Illinois, which is basically the, the crown jewel for law enforcement in Illinois, the Midwest, and the country. And you're a big part of that. So thank you so much for your service. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks, Sydney. Sure. <laughs> and tell her good take, luck. All right, I love take care. Thank you. All right. Bye now. Take care. Thank you for listening to the opening statement with Joe Shannon. You can find us on the internet at shannonlawgroup.com or telephone our office at 312-578-9501. Have a terrific day.